Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for today's Protocol Labs Research Seminar. Today, we are joined by Alex Mikulov, who is a final year PhD student at MIT EECS. He's worked on research in theoretical computer science and machine learning. He is also broadly interested in the design and implementation of systems that simplify how we compute and organize data. Today, he will be presenting Mandala, a high-level data management language implemented in Python. So, Alex, I'm going to let you take it from here, and thank you so much for joining us today. All right. Yeah, thank you for introducing me. Today, I'm going to tell you about this sort of programming language, which is broadly speaking for um, managing data produced by computations. And while this is originally inspired by uh, things like machine learning and data science applications, I believe uh, these same abstractions can be uh, very useful and a natural fit for um, things like uh, content addressable computation, which is probably what you're more interested in here. To just uh, dive right into it, I'm first going to give you a um, short overview of uh, first the problem of data management and then uh, just sketch where we're going with this talk. Um, and to motivate things a little bit, um, here's, a, here's a file name um, that you um, may have seen something like this if you've done uh, some machine learning or data science uh, experiments. Um, and this file name tells the story in a way, um, presumably the story of how this file came to be. And this story doesn't look like a very happy one for whoever has to, to deal with this file. And to just unpack a little bit um, the different participants in this story, if you will, um, we have, first of all, the kind of quantity that's being represented by this file, which actually makes a lot of sense. It's, it's pretty reasonable um, thing to include in a file name. Then we have uh, some parameters, which presumably participate in the computation of, this, uh, of the contents of this file in some way. However, it's not completely clear how they do so. Um, then we have some versioning information. Again, it's uh, unclear at all what this uh, versioning refers to. And finally, and worst of all, we have these um, subjective annotations that people just like sprinkling around when they're in a hurry. And as you can see, um, as usual, uh, final is not the last item on the list. Um, and good luck figuring out what any of these mean like a week uh, down the line or a month or whatever amount of time. Um, so, so yeah, so this is, uh, in some sense, maybe the worst of, uh, data management. Um, and in general, the, the problem of, of scientific data management, uh, would be to, you know, deal with things like this, meaning, uh, save, load, query, um, delete, and otherwise just organize, uh, quantities of this sort. This, this file name, as we said, is a very naive, um, and the, probably one of the worst approaches um, to data management. Um, and um, the starting observation for this, for this whole project is that um, there is actually something else that tells the story of how this file came to be, um, namely the code that you use to, to, to generate the contents of this file. Um, I'm going to argue that um, this code is in many ways a better um, telling of this story. Of, of, of the contents of this file. And uh, where we're going with this is that basically we're going to, in some way, replace this file name as a way to refer to this file's contents by the code itself. So um, this probably sounds very weird at this point, so I have some explaining to do about this. Um, so first of all, let's uh, briefly see how code tells the story in a better way. Um, and there's actually a bunch of things to note here. Um, so first of all, the code producing this, um, this final quantity is unambiguous um, in a very strong sense. So relative to all the functions that you've defined here, um, the way these functions are composed to produce this quantity uh, is perfectly clear from the code. Another nice thing about um, thinking of code as the name for uh, whatever data you're, you're, you're creating is that code is very expressive. So especially in uh, imperative uh, programming languages, you can um, tell all sorts of uh, very different stories for how your, for how your data um, comes to exist. And code allows you to, to do so very nicely. Um, another maybe more subtle thing is that code also implicitly encodes um, computational relations between the quantities being computed. 
Um, and in things like uh, data science and machine learning, and uh, surely not, not only in these uh, domains, um, what we typically care about when we have a bunch of data like this is some sort of query that asks, okay, so how do my, for example, final metrics that are at, at the bottom of, of this piece of code um, going to depend on some initial parameters? And since code implicitly contains um, precisely the relationship from these initial parameters to these final metrics, it also is in a good position to kind of uh, somehow automatically keep track of this and allow you to query things. Um, another nice thing about code is um, it is um, it has very naturally editable structure. So here we have um, the story of a certain piece of data. And if you want to pass to another sort of story, for example, if we want to remove the pre-processing, um, we can just delete these two lines of code, like in the middle of this here, um, and um, like very easily switch to this uh, different story for a different piece of data. Or if we want to change, uh, for example, what alpha is, you can just go to the part of the code where alpha is defined and you know change that. And the final thing, um, code is also refactorable, which is especially easy to do in modern IDEs. And um, this uh, refactorability, um, if you if you adopt code as a name for your data, um, allows you to evolve the story of your data as your code evolves. So you do you, you evolve these two things jointly in some sense. Um, all right, so this has been uh, you know a lot of advantages of code. However, um, you know the real question is uh, you know code is so great. Um, so if if it's so great, you know why not just use code itself instead of file names? Um, and more generally speaking, why not use code itself as the principal interface to the storage of its results? Um, and this this probably sounds a little bit radical at this point, maybe even um, a little bit hopeless. Um, but what I'm going to argue in the rest of this talk is that, um, in fact, it's it's not only uh, doable, it is actually um, very fruitful to, to do so. And it can dramatically simplify both the, the, the code that you need to write for data management and also the, the concepts that you need to, to work with in, in your mind. Um, and just to give you a quick sketch of uh, how we're going to uh, actually implement this, so there's there's going to be two main components to the system that have to work together in some sense. And the first component is a very um, radical uh, form of memoization or very, um, I guess, aggressive form of memoization. And the idea here, here would be that um, you write some experimental primitives as uh, Python functions in this case, and then uh, you go and you, you combine these primitives into experiments um, by using whatever, um, whatever like control flow and data structures you want. Um, and each of the function calls to these functions is going to be memoized. Um, and this is um, what, what you can refer to as a composable sort of memoization. Um, and as we're going to see, this um, memoization is very uh, tightly integrated with um, core features of Python, um, like, as I mentioned, data structures, control flow, uh, subroutines in a way that um, prevents uh, or avoids data duplication and also keeps um, track of all relationships between the things that you're computing behind the scenes. Because you're always, um, if, if all the function calls that you're uh, doing are memoized, um, you know, this is going to mean that um, you can, in storage, actually uh, recover the chain of events that led up to a certain thing existing. Um, and then uh, another powerful thing about this um, sort of end-to-end -end memoization approach is that um, once you have a piece of code like this that you've already executed, um, so everything's been memoized, everything's been computed, and then if you want to interact with, with the results of this code, you can simply just re-execute or uh, retrace this code. So you can step through this code again, um, except now that everything's been computed, you're not computing anything new, so you're not doing uh, any heavy work. Instead, you're just um, traversing the storage in some sense. And by combining this with um, you know, uh, some imperative uh, control flow, you can do um, very expressive um, imperative queries to your storage. So you can take a piece of code like this, you can uh, rearrange some parts of it, uh, maybe add some more logic. And this gives you a very powerful way to interact with storage directly by just using um, the tool you're most familiar with, namely the programming language you're working in. 
Um, so this is the first component. And then the second component um, is a declarative query interface, which is in some sense complementary to this uh, imperative query interface that I've been talking about so far. Um, and here the idea is that um, if you look at this code, it's actually very similar to the code we had before for uh, computing things uh, or uh, traversing search, um, except um, because of this uh, query context manager here, um, this code is interpreted in a very different way. And what it actually does is behind the scenes, it, it builds this uh, graph of computational relations instead of computing anything. So this this piece of code is going to define some sort of a combinatorial representation of your workflow. Um, and then uh, it's going to be able to compile this to SQL. So you don't really need to know anything about SQL to be using this. Uh, you, you're using uh, things that are completely uh, familiar to you, like these, um, these functions that you're working with. Um, but behind the scenes, this is uh, compiled to SQL. So you're using a very powerful um, query language uh, behind the scenes. And um, you use this sort of structure to then ask uh, questions of the sort, you know, for all the experiments that I've done that I've recorded in this storage. Um, what is, um, or like give me, or like uh, you're asking, give me a table of, of all, the, all the things that satisfy um, basically these computational relations uh, specified by this piece of code. Um, and just to quickly mention, this idea also appears in um, a Julia project, um, which has a bit of a different focus. Um, it's called their uh, conjunctive query. So you can uh, look this up if you're interested. Um, all right, um, so this is for the main components. And then just to give you a quick idea of why this would be a useful thing to do at all. Um, the first big reason would be just a massive code reduction. So if you have um, some experiment that you're doing, um, and it has like a bunch of moving parts, then depending on, you know, which parts you've computed already or which parts you want to query um, or which parts you want to save, uh, you're writing all these um, different pieces of code that are somehow, um, all of them about the same workflow and the same logic that you have. Um, but all of them also have this additional stuff that you have to, you know, go and deal with um, to accommodate a specific data management use case. And with uh, Mandela, you can essentially just uh, remove all this complexity and go back to, you know, the simplest, um, in some sense, canonical expression of your um, workflow, of the logic of what you're doing. And you can repurpose this code for all sorts of different um, goals that you would need to write extra code for naively. So this uh, first benefit is a massive reduction in the amount of code that you have to write and maintain. Um, and then the other um, big advantage of this is that um, maybe a bit more subtle, um, but still quite useful in practice is that we have all these things like data structures and control flow and subroutines and refactoring um, that we have traditionally used for managing the complexity of software. And they've been uh, very successful for that. Uh, and with Mandela, you can leverage the same concepts um, to, uh, in a very natural way, manage the complexity of the data associated with the code that you're working on. Um, all right, so this is um, for the overview. And then just for a quick plan of uh, where we're going with the rest of this. So first, I'm just going to show you a demo. So, so this is, a, this is a, actually a working system. So I'm, I'm going to show you a demo of how these things work in a very um, artificial, minimal context. Um, then I'm going to discuss different ways in which these programming patterns can be scaled up to more complex projects that have more moving parts um, and they're changing and, uh, and you, you keep adding more parts to them. Um, and in particular, I'm going to talk about how things like data structures and subroutines uh, seamlessly integrate with these programming patterns that I'm describing. Um, then I'm also going to talk a little bit about refactoring, which is uh, a necessity um, if you're doing uh, some sort of computational experiments because you're always um, adjusting things and coming up with uh, new ways of doing things. And if you um, have a bunch of data already, you know, sitting in your storage that's, uh, you know, connected to like the old version of your code, it may be very, um, very painful to, to, to adjust to a new um, to a new code base. And this, these refactoring primitives that I'm going to show you are exactly um, kind of streamlining this, this process. And finally, I'm going to um, conclude with some, uh, 
some more uh, uh, or like a, a broader vision for 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 uh, for where this uh, is hopefully going. Now we're actually onto the demo, so I'm gonna pull up just uh, a Jupyter uh, notebook here, um, where I'm going to show you just like the very 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 basic form of these uh, programming patterns that I've been talking about. Um, so first, I'm going to just uh, do some imports and set up set up the storage. Um, so as you can see, this says that it's uh, in memory. Um, this is just to make this uh, example simpler. Um, typically, for a large project, you would write this on disk. Um, so, okay, so we've created a storage. Um, and now to demo the memoization, we're going to start in the simplest possible way. So I have this uh, increment function here that prints out the message. And um, I'm decorating it uh, here with this op decorator stands for operation. Um, and I'm pointing it to the storage. And when I define this, I'm what I'm doing essentially is connecting this function to the storage. So now the storage um, knows that there's this function called increment. It knows about its signature and uh, other things like that. And now that I've defined this, um, the way I write to storage in Mandela is uh, primarily by doing function calls. So this is the whole memorization business that I've been talking about. Um, and the simplest example of this, the hello world, would be to just um, create this, this round context with the storage and you call this function inside. And as you would expect, um, you get this message printed out. So, so we, we ran a function and we put the result of this in storage. Um, so now the first important thing to understand is when I do this again, um, what's going to happen is um, that I don't, or what's not going to happen is that I don't, I don't get this message printed out anymore. And this is because the storage already knows that I've done this work, that I've called this function on this input. So what happens is that it, it bypasses um, the function execution and it directly just loads the result from the storage. And we can actually look at what this result is. So I'm just going to print it. And as you would expect, this is uh, 24, so it's 23 plus one. Um, however, there's also this stuff around it. And the reason, the reason that this 24 is wrapped inside this object is so that the system can keep track of, um, of things. And in particular, we have this most important property of, of this object is the UID, um, which is you know, some meaningless uh, identifier that serves as some sort of um, pointer to a storage location for this result. All right. Um, so, so far, so good. Um, this is a pretty basic memorization stuff. And then uh, where this gets more interesting is when you start um, creating more and more functions and composing them in more and more expressive ways. So as a steps towards this, um, I'm defining here this add function, which again, prints out the message, adds two numbers. Um, and now I can create this uh, mini workflow or mini uh, experiment, if you will on um, uh, adding numbers. <laughs> so what I'm doing in this, in this piece of code here is I'm ranging over some values of i, and then I'm saying, you know, j is gonna be uh, the ink of i, and then final is going to be the add of i and j. Um, so I can, again, run this, and as you can see, a bunch of stuff gets printed out. Um, by the way, one of these increments that we're doing is we're incrementing 23, which we've already done. Um, so as you can see, this is not uh, showing up. So this is why you have these two consecutive calls to add here. All right. Um, so, okay, so this is great. So we've computed all these things. We've put all these things in storage. And now the same thing applies that applied before that if I run this again, nothing actually gets computed. Um, and this is the, the retracing um, part that I was talking about. So when you have a piece of code like this and you've already executed it, um, just running through it again, doesn't do any computation. It just retraces its steps. So this is uh, the retracing pattern. Um, and so going back, oh, sorry. And so um, I guess um, expanding a little bit on this retracing pattern, um, what, uh, this pattern is very good for is not simply, um, you know, revisiting code you've already executed. 
Um, what is very good for is um, actually making your code very open to extension. So, and, and this uh, openness uh, can uh, hold in many different ways. So for example, I can take this, this code and I can extend, for example, this uh, range of parameters. And I can also add some logic here. Um, and when I run this, um, I am basically adding more computation on top of what I've already done before. Um, so I mean, this is very useful in things like um, if you're doing exploratory um, data analysis or machine learning. Um, this, make, this, this, this retracing pattern makes it very easy to iterate on a piece of code in the simplest way possible um, without actually um, having to really think about how you're organizing your data or like how to avoid computing things you've already computed. Um, so, so that's a very nice pattern. Um, another um, very related um, pattern in which you can use this uh, retracing is as a sort of um, query interface. So for example, if I'm interested in some values for i here, I can just um, edit this code and go over these, these values and just collect these results. So yeah, so you can, um, you know, even more flexibly um, modify a piece of code to just use it as directly as a way to traverse the storage and as an imperative query interface. Um, and the final thing to mention about this retracing pattern, um, which uh, is uh, very important if you're doing some long running um, experiments or computations, is that, um, you know, if you have a workflow like this and it fails at some point, which uh, tends to happen sometimes with long running computations, um, restarting this computation is uh, trivial because you don't really need to write any extra code to do this and you don't need to um, prepare in advance uh, your, your code for resumability. Um, what you do is simply you, you run this piece of code again and it's going to retrace its steps up to the first point uh, where it failed and then just continue computing from there. All right, um, so this was the memoization demo. Um, and uh, any, any, any questions about the code so far? Uh, I have just one yeah. question. Yeah. So if you have like two different developers basically interacting with this system and m maybe they don't even know what each other is doing, if they both define the same increment function, would they be hitting benefiting from each other's cache basically right um yeah so um it depends so certainly the focus until now for implementation has been on like a single <laughs> a single developer but you could um totally imagine this uh, sort of caching taking place um the thing is um they will have to uh really be sure that they are pointing to the same um, function behind the scenes because these functions, uh, like this ink, for example, when you're defining this, mm -hmm. um, is going to assign to this function some permanent identifier behind the mm -hmm. scenes. Um, and so if the other person uh, makes sure that they're pointing to the same identifier, then yes, they're going to be sharing um, their work if they point to the same storage, yes. Um, I'm, I imagine that this is actually it's probably possible to generalize it even if they if they haven't stored the you know if they're not pointing to the same function in the sense that you are describing because you could presumably derive the identity of the function based on the structure inside so that like if two people implemented the same function it would have the same right identity. right right, right, right. Probably... yeah it's definitely yeah definitely a very interesting question it also ties to a lot of for example, if you want to do versioning, you like if you had a structure representation that completely specifies the semantics of your function, this mm -hmm. would be wonderful. Um, yeah. So yeah, the thing is, um, yeah, this is also a bit um, maybe uh, rough around the edges to do this. So for example, here you have this print statement, right? So it adds nothing to the semantics. So you have to exclude it somehow. Mm -hmm. You could imagine like all sorts of other things that you know look um, semantic maybe, but actually don't really matter. Like you could have some. Um, dead code, for example, or something like this. So, yeah, it is a little bit tricky, even though it would be wonderful. Yeah, if 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 you would do it, it would unlock a whole lot of other 
things also. So not just like even for a single developer, it would be very useful to have this sort of um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. introspection to be able to do it. And you, you know, of course, you can pass to a more restricted uh, DSL, and then you you could be able to to do something like this. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Cool. Mm, all right. So so yeah. So this is for the memorization. So this this has been the demo of um, I guess how this works from a user point of view. Um, maybe what's more interesting. Um, for you is also how it works behind the scenes. So to unpack a little bit what goes on when I call one of these functions. So for example, if you take the, the add function, um, it has two arguments, X and Y. As I already mentioned, it also has some uh, permanent UID throughout the life of this function. So even if you change things about this function, it's going to have uh, always this UID uh, during the course of its life. And then if you pass in some arguments, the first step would be to assign UIDs to these arguments as well. And so you do this uh, very nicely, just wrapping these inputs by content, um, which uh, works well enough when your inputs are uh, simple enough things. Um, and, and you assign UIDs based on this content hash. So then once you have this, um, the next step is to compute a UID for this call. And the way you do this is you combine, you know, all the UIDs that you see here. Um, you pass them to a hash function. You arrive at some fixed length uh, UID for describing that describes the entire call. Um, and the final step, uh, now that you have uh, this call UID, you have to decide if you're going to uh, compute or if you're going to load from storage. Um, so based on the call UID, you do some storage lookup, and then if you don't find a call, there's there's no choice. You have to compute. So you compute, you save the results, and then you return this um, this uh, value reference that has its own UID that you can pass to future functions. Um, and if the call is found, um, and that's the easier one, you just load the results and you return something identical to what you computed the first time. The demo of this second part um, that I mentioned, namely the, the declarative query component, um, this is going to refer to the previous workflow we had. So, so we have this workflow. Um, and now I'm going to, or rather, we actually had with the other thing. So we have this workflow. Um, and now I'm going to make a relational query to this workflow. Um, and this is best understood by going through this uh, maybe line by line. So um, first we have this, this query context that tells us that we're doing a query, we're not computing anything. Um, and then um, here we had a loop over i. So we had some variation over i. And now we're replacing this variation by this um, query object, which um, basically tells the system that i is going to be like this, this placeholder that at this point can match anything in the storage. Um, and then to make this more interesting, when you have the same line, which is identical to, to what we had in the computation, when you say the J is inc of I, you are saying um, basically whatever I can match, J can only match uh, inc of this. And then when I add this last line um, of the computation, which again is identical to what we had before, I'm saying that whatever I and J can match to, final must match the add of I and J. So I specify this uh, combinatorial uh, structure expressing these computational relations. So this, this is what this part is for. And then to query this, I call this get table function and I pass some local variables that I've defined up here. Uh, and I get out a table. And just to make this a little bit more uh, meaningful, I can name these, these things here. As you can see, we get out this table. And if you look more closely, you notice that in each of each of the rows of this table, um, the value in the in the second column is one plus the value of the first column. And this is because we have this constraint. Um, and the value in the last column is the sum of the values in the first two columns. And this is because we have this constraint. So hopefully um, this example makes it a bit clear. And just to um, really um, go a little bit deeper into this, um, I'm going to also show you how line by line, what you're doing with this query interface would correspond to a SQL 
uh, query or SQL-ish, I guess, in this case. <laughs> so when you get to the first line, uh, if you translate this to SQL, what this would mean is essentially that you only know that you're going to be selecting some stuff. Then when you add this first line um, and you say I equals this query placeholder, what this tells um, the SQL compiler is that you're going to be selecting um, the table of all values in storage um, and or you're going to be selecting from a copy of this table of all values named I. Then when you add the second line, um, the J equals ink of I, um, this is going to be interpreted in a very similar way. So there's going to be another copy of the table of values. This time it's going to be called J. And you're also adding this constraint that J is ink of I. And then the last uh, line is also, or the last uh, part of this computational, of these computational relationships um, also has a very similar effect to the query. So you are um, conjuncting on this new constraint of final is the add of fine J on top of the constraints you had before. And finally, when you call this get table function, it tells you what it is you are selecting from this. This was just a basic demo. And um, now I'm going to talk about how to actually scale this up to more interesting um, use cases. Um, so, so far I've been talking about, you know, um, this, uh, what we have here, like this retracing pattern, which tells you, you know, if you want to get to something in storage, just walk over the code that computes this thing, right? which, which sounds like it could take ages for certain things. Like if you have lots and lots of code, um, just walking through this code again uh, could take a long amount of time, even if you're not computing anything. Um, and so this is why this, this, this pattern, like scaling up this pattern, this, this pattern may sound a little bit uh, hopeless maybe, but what I'm about to show you is how you can actually, um, uh, in, in very natural ways, overcome these sorts of problems. And the second part of the demo is going to be based on um, this random forest example. So you don't really have to know anything about random forest um, beyond the fact that I'm going to explain here that it's a machine learning classification algorithm. And as typical in machine learning, you have some examples, you have some labels, and you have some uh, randomized decision tree training algorithm. And you're going to pass these examples and labels to this algorithm many, many times to get a bunch of uh, random decision trees. And these trees together um, comprise your random forest. And then when you want to make a new prediction on some example, you take the predictions from all these trees, you do a majority vote on them, and this is your final prediction. And for this example, we're going to have um, just a few functions that basically go over what I just explained. So the first function takes no inputs and just give, gives you the data set that you're going to use. So it gives you examples and labels. Um, then there's a function to train a single decision tree. So it's going to take in some examples, some labels, and some random state just to keep track of uh, the randomness. And it's going to return a tree. And then there's going to be a function to evaluate the entire forest. So it's going to take a list of trees. So this represents uh, the random forest. It's going to take in the examples and the labels and uh, give you back the accuracy of this forest on this data set. Um, and one notable thing here is you have this uh, list data structure appearing in one of the arguments of our functions. And part of, uh, part of this example is to demonstrate how these sorts of data structures seamlessly combine with these patterns that I've been talking about. All right, um, so these are the functions. And then the workflow uh, that we're going to start with is um, basically what you would expect given these functions. So we're going to uh, create uh, this data set. We're going to train 50 random decision trees on this data set um, and you know, uh, encapsulate them as a list. And finally, we're going to evaluate um, the random forest uh, consisting of these trees uh, on this uh, very same data set. Um, so going back to the notebook. So I'm just going to set up what I've been talking about here. And we have these functions that I talked about. You don't even need to, to read this code. Um, and here we have this, um, let me make this a little bit larger. We have this initial workflow that, I, that I've described. Um, and we can run this. That's pretty great. We get some accuracy of 0.94. Um, and now 
you know, despite this uh, list here and things like that, um, running this code again, again, has the property that, you know, running code twice with Mando always has, which is that it's not going to compute anything. So running this again, it, it, if you notice, it took uh, less time. This is because it's not really training anything. It's just retracing the steps. Um, and I mean, again, we get to this, to this number. Um, and if you think about this a workflow a little bit, you can uh, notice you can notice actually some problems with this. Um, and the, I guess the problems are clearest to understand if you think about what what work you have to do to get to this last thing in the workflow, this uh, forest accuracy. So this this accuracy of the of the random forest, um, it's just a single number. So it's a very small thing in storage. It's a very fast to load. Um, however. By using this retracing pattern, um, getting to this to this number is um, is very it causes you to do some very heavy work. So one unfortunate thing you have to do is you have to go through this loop again. So you have to loop through each of these function calls, and when you're doing that, you're like, oh, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. So you you know you've done all these things, but you're still looping through them. Um, and the other um, inefficient thing about this workflow is along the path to this final uh, you know, single number, you're loading all these um, things from storage. And they could be potentially very large objects that you, you don't even want to look at for your use case. Um, so these are the problems. And um, we're actually going to show um, some very simple ways to, to solve each of these problems. So to overcome this um, looping problem, what you can do, and uh, what's very natural from software engineering actually, is that you're going to put this loop into a function. And now instead of looping through 50 things, you have to just go through one function call. This is going to be it. Um, and then to deal with this problem of potentially loading these um, huge things from storage, uh, you're going to do lazy loading, which basically only ever loads something from storage if it really needs it for computation. Um, so this is where we're going with this. And now in a little bit more detail, um, so the first, going back to, to, to these problems, so we're going to first fix the first problem um, by using essentially subroutines um, and adapt them to data management. So these are what are um, these so-called higher level memoized functions. Um, so if you recall this, this problematic part of the workflow that we had, this highlighted line here, uh, this loop, what we're going to do is we're going to extract it as a function. Um, so I'm defining this function, train trees, um, I'm, you know, exposing some of the things it needs to compute whatever it's computing as uh, inputs. Um, and it's returning this list of decision trees. Um, and I'm, I've just taken this piece of code and I've just put it into this function. Uh, and if you notice, uh, the decorator here is different. It's uh, before it used to be up, now it's super up, um, which reflects the fact that in this, in this high level memoized function, you can actually call other memoized functions which is not something you can do in like the lowest level um, memoized functions. Um, so you extract this as a function and then you just go back to your workflow and you refactor it. Um, so we can, we can actually do this like exactly what I just described. We can execute this. Um, and now here's the refactored workflow. So this is the refactored line. Everything else is the same. Um, and I can run this. And as you can see, again, we're getting to the same thing we had before, um, but now we are um, going through this new function. And now if I run this again, um, something actually a little bit different is going to happen from the first time when you run it. And um, this, I think, um, deserves a little bit of um, note. So, so going back to, to this workflow that we refactored, um, if you think about what happens the first time you pass through it, um, so a lot of the stuff is the same as in, in, the, in the inefficient workflow we had before, except now we're going to get to this call to this uh, new function train trees. Um, so when this happens, um, because this is a brand new function, there's no calls to this function in storage. So you're not going to find this, this, this call for, this, for these inputs in storage. And what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to actually go inside the body of this function and uh, retrace whatever is happening in there. Um, and this means uh, going through this loop again. Um, 
And finally, you're going to come out of this loop. You're going to get, um, you know, finally the list of fees. You're going to return this. And importantly, you're going to save the call to this function, to this uh, new function, train trees. You're going to save this call in the storage. Um, and then you're going to proceed with everything else as you did before. And the important thing that happens here is that by running this code, you've essentially created this shortcut to the storage. So you, you've had to go through the loop again, but now that you've, you've done, that you've done, sorry, that you've done this thing, that you've saved the code to this new function, you've created a shortcut um, in storage. So that the second time you pass this new workflow, again, you're going to get to this uh, call to train trees, but now you're going to find this in the storage. So you're going to skip directly to, to the final thing. And then again, everything else is going to proceed as it did before. So you've essentially kind of patched your storage to introduce a shortcut that allows you to, um, you know, jump over these uninteresting calls that you don't want to retrace every time. Clearly, um, uh, a nice way to solve this problem. Um, however, um, this a very um, simple and natural idea of using subroutines um, is also useful for a range of um, other things. Um, so one thing, um, so what subroutines are usually, you know, employed at, employed to do in um, software engineering is to manage the complexity of code. And uh, this uh, abstraction actually allows you to kind of carry this over to manage the complexity of data. Um, so as mentioned, this uh, can be used to optimize retracing. Um, on a more, I guess, philosophical note, um, these high level functions kind of make this bet that in any um, sufficiently complicated um, project created by humans, there are going to be these um, stable higher level or stable hierarchies of abstractions that humans come up with just even to, you know, be able to keep things in memory even. Um, and, and these high level memoized functions kind of allow you to tap into this phenomenon and go beyond, um, you know, the way we, we use this phenomenon in software engineering, where we're just structuring, you know, code that has nothing to do with like, uh, you know, some data associated or, or there's like no data associated with this code. Um, and these high level memoized functions allow you to kind of uh, generalize this to also uh, manage the data connected to the code. Um, and a final thing that I'm going to uh, show you some more pictures about in the next few slides is um, this sort of hierarchical structuring also optimizes the, the, the declarative query interface um, that I've showed you before. Um, and just as a quick example of this, um, this is a, a, just a different workflow just for the purposes of illustration. Um, imagine you have some workflow like this where you pre-process some data, and then you train a model on this, um, and then finally you evaluate this model. So just very basic uh, machine learning stuff. And imagine you've run this uh, sort of workflow with many different um, instantiations of all the quantities here. So many different data sets, many different values of alpha, uh, many different labels, even though the labels would vary jointly with the data set. Um, and you, you've run this many, many times. You've, you've uh, computed you know, many different uh, accuracies um, depending on what, what things you start from. And um, if you think about the relational picture of this or what this might look like um, in your database as a, as a mental picture, you're going to have something like this. So you're going to have, um, so here in, in green, I'm going to have uh, sort of like, you can think of them as like one column tables that uh, keep, you know, all the different variables of, of the local variables in this piece of code. Um, and in red, I have these um, tables with more columns um, that correspond to the functions that are being called here. Um, and, and, and this is a very useful mental picture to have just for what what's going on behind the scenes when you use this uh, declarative query interface. Um, and, and these red arrows here are essentially foreign keys from the memorization tables of these functions to you know, whatever uh, values of, of, the, of, of the inputs corresponding to a call. Um, and if you want to use the, the declarative interface to query something like this, uh, what you typically want is maybe, you know, to get a table of the joint dependency between X, Y, alpha, and accuracy. And to do this, you'd have to um, do some join of these tables. So you have to join a bunch of tables to get to this final result. 
which, uh, you know, is fine if you're joining like a few small tables, but if you have like a project with like a hundred functions or something like that, uh, it may be more problematic. Um, and what these high level memoized functions allow you to do is essentially to just, just draw this abstraction boundary around this um, and replace this with a single function that kind of encapsulates whatever is going on inside this, um, in, inside this box that we have here. Um, and now that you do this, um, you don't have to join any tables anymore. So you literally have the answer to your query like in this uh, single table. So this is how um, these higher level functions allow you to optimize queries. Um, and then, um, or maybe this is a good time to actually stop to see if there is any questions about this at this point. No questions? All right. Um, so this was about um, these uh, high level memoized functions. And now the other optimization that I mentioned, I'm just going to very briefly describe is this lazy loading. So it's basically what you would expect. So you have this uh, one keyword. Now we can actually, we can actually do this here. So you have this uh, lazy uh, keyword in your context and this makes the entire context um, use this lazy loading. So you run this and you see now the, the final thing I end up with this accuracy, it's, it's not in memory. Um, and in fact, none of the things along the way are loaded in memory. So what's going to happen when I run this um, is that like when I get to this first line, X and Y are just going to be pointers to storage locations without any data. Um, and then trees, uh, even even better. Um, so trees is, you know, um, technically it's, it's going to be, in, in Python is going to be a list of things. Um, however, um, the lazy loading is so lazy that it doesn't represent this as a list of pointers to storage. It represents this as a single pointer to a list of things in storage. And it's only going to load this uh, list if it really needs it for anything. So for example, in this code that we have here, um, so this, this trees is like a single pointer, but that's enough because this pointer has a UID. Um, and so this UID is enough for this uh, call to the next function down the line to see, oh, I've done this call before. I don't care about the contents of this list. I can just you know, give you the result of this call. And so it's sufficient like this. And there's all sorts of other um, things um, that are involved in the implementation of this lazy loading, but the bottom line of all these optimizations is that they are defined so that whatever control flow you have, um, if you add this lazy equals true to your code, it's not going to break your control flow. So you have conditionals or iteration or things like that. Um, it's going to uh, keep working with this uh, lazy loading. So it's going to figure out what it needs to load. Um, and then um, I'm going to just very briefly mention some more advanced uh, query patterns. So if you remember this query we had uh, in the beginning, um, it's a very simple one, but there are some things to note about it. So one is that all constraints that you specify here are going to apply to whatever you're querying. And then another thing is what if I have data structures in my workflow? So how do I even encode this as a computational graph? Um, and um, there's answers to both of these questions um, that you can, uh, if you're interested, um, I have more slides on this in the appendix, so I can, uh, Talk this talk about this afterwards, um, but the bottom line is that um, first of all you can you can match two data structures in these queries. It's a little bit more involved, but you can do it. Um, so this is what this um, make list construct here is for. And then you can also partition the constraints in your queries with this uh, branching construct. And what the effect of this is going to be is that for each block of code in a branch either all of the constraints are going to apply or none of them. Um, and how these constraints are going to be determined is going to be based on context. So if I re request something, or if I request some um, variables only from, from this block, if I want to get a table involving variables only from this block, I'm not going to activate these constraints. Um, however, if I request some cons or some variables from, from this block, and they depend on some things from this block, then I'm going to activate all the constraints in, in both of these blocks. Um, 
but this is just uh, scratching the surface. I mean, there's uh, a bit more details to it. Um, but the bottom line is, uh, you can you can use this to partition um, the logic of your uh, workflows. Um, and why is this um, actually useful? At least in machine learning, it often happens that you have some initial data processing, and then you branch into several different um, ways of um, trying to extract some information from the data, whether it's going to be training some uh, machine learning model or doing some data analysis. Uh, and this sort of structure um, with, with the branches allows you to reuse the code for the initial stages and add on top of this um, the different branches that you're exploring in a way that doesn't cause the constraints from these branches to interfere with each other. And of course, you can do this recursively, so you can uh, branch even more. From, from one branch, you can have multiple branches afterwards and so on and so forth. Um, and another nice thing about this is um, that these different levels of abstraction of, that uh, I've been talking about with these high level memoized functions can coexist in the structure of your queries. Um, so if you want to treat one of these higher level functions as a black box, then you can do this, but you can also have a different branch in which you kind of look inside what's going on in this function. And the whole intention for these for these patterns is to enable you to you know however complicated the project you have with many different you know branches and pieces of logic um to be able to write down a single queryable piece of code that captures this logic so that you can um if, if you want to query you know whatever relationship you only have to point to the to the variables that you're querying and don't have to write extra code for this um so this is the motivation for this um, and finally, I'm just going to very quickly mention refactoring because I think we're uh, nearly out of time here. Um, so there's various ways to refactor things um, in this in this um, model of storage. Um, and one way is to just extend the functionality of a function. So before we had this um, function that creates our data set that didn't take any arguments. Um, and now if I want, I can just expose some parameter from inside this function as an argument. And I'm going to do this while keeping the relationship to whatever calls I had for this function before. Um, so what this looks like on the level, like behind the scenes in, in the memoization table is going to be that I'm just adding retroactively this new column to my table. And all the things in this column are going to point to the default value that I've created for this argument. And this has a bunch of um, you know, useful uh, applications, especially in contexts like uh, um, exploratory um, data science, where you always want to like tweak and add new behaviors to functions. And then the other thing you can, the other way in which you can refactor thing is to um, create a completely new version of something. So you're going to forget about all the past calls to this function. Um, and for example, as you can see here, we have this function called inc, which actually decrements a number. So this illustrates one use case of this, uh, which would be just to fix a bug in this function. So if you notice that one of your functions has a bug uh, and you just want to fix this bug, you can create a new version, then you can recompute everything that you've done. And it's going to, you know, recompute only the things that depend on this um, faulty function that you have. And in general, you can do other sorts of backward incompatible changes. Or if you want, you can also force recomputation of this function. Um, all right, so this was just a bit about refactoring, but um, I just wanna say a few words about like the, the, the vision for this whole thing um, and uh, where I hope to, to be able to take it is essentially to enable this uh, metaphor with these programming patterns that I've been showing you of this um, infinite interactive session because um, if you think about it, um, in an inter infinite interactive session, you don't really have to save or load anything um, because it's all, all of it is in memory. So you don't have to even think, you know, how am I going to organize this? You know, how am I going to save and load something? Um, and what, what Mandela uh, essentially enables you to kind of pretend is that you are working in this infinite interactive session. And uh, what's more, it, it actually makes this makes this uh, sort of a metaphor practical by adding all these uh, memoization um, features and uh, queryability features to this, so that um, you can address all the objects in this infinite uh, interactive session um, by using directly the code that produces these objects. Um, 
So, so, so this is if it is like a one sentence metaphor for 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 um, the whole motivation for this would it would be something like this. Um, so yeah, so I think I'm pretty much done with the presentation part. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alex, for joining us today for yeah, uh, Recall Labs Research Seminar. Um, for anyone who wants to follow along to make sure you catch these live, follow us at Proto Research on Twitter, and then you can also sign up for the uh, monthly emails with the schedule to be sent directly to your email in the description below. So thanks again. Yeah, thanks everyone. That was great.